to set up all this um, video for us today. And our treasurer I know here, Joanne Johnston, and our vice president, Irene Singel. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. And they, their support is, is, couldn't do this without them. Um, the thing about this fire that caught my attention was, I never knew anything about it. It was from, I was in Western Maine at the time. Well, I, my family was, and so when we moved up here, I didn't think that, um, I didn't know anything about it. So I did some research, I read Joyce Butler's book, which I highly recommend, because it lists, um, the newest version lists people involved in the fire, plus locations, plus all the little details that, that you may um, be curious about for your own family in your own town. But I think the thing that got me most were the stories. On our displays, we have some wonderful stories about what people went through. Some of them little memories of just that are locked in their memory and their family history, all the way to big stories. There was a young man who went to fight the fire. His family left their home, they were evacuated. They didn't know if he was alive, he didn't think they were alive. And the Red Cross brought them together. And I think that is really the essence of this. There was another woman who I was sharing with somebody. She still sleeps in the Red, the Red Cross bed that they gave her back then. Um, things, there were also awful things. Uh, somebody came to somebody's farm, said, I'll take your cows for you, and I'll take them to safety. And he never saw his cows again. They were stolen. Lots of things like that. So there was a human toll. People had to move. That's why it flocked in my memory changed the whole forest in this area and um, changed people's lives forever. And it's part of family history. How many of you, I'm thinking a lot, how many of you have like direct experience through family about the fire? Okay, raise your hand please. Okay, does anyone have something like that they just wanted to say out loud about what happened with their family? We have a lot of them written down in notebooks and on the display. Anybody want to share anything that? Well, I remember my dad saying he fought the fire, the 47 forest fire on my parents' end, during my parents' anniversary, because oh they got married God. on October 11th. Oh, oh my gosh. Pat, there's a similar story, right? Yeah, she's my sister-in-law. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> 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 <it's> actually... <laughs> um, the thing about also the research is the people who went through the fire as, as adults or, or late or teens, they came home and talked about it with their family. Their family went through it. Then it went down to the, the younger children. They were told to remember it. And then the grandchildren. And not to be sad about something, but I think that's how history is really created real history, those oral stories. So on our website, we have some oral histories of people that have done some things. Sandra Karen from Lyman, she has an oral history on the Rip Store Museum um, site. So there's lots and lots of, um, lots of information, lots of resources for you. This movie is from, um, did you know who made it? Oh, go ahead. So I have to relay this uh, the story. Uh, maybe some of you may know uh, Barbara Pillsbury. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, her grandparents, my oh, yeah, grandparents. Her grandparents and my grandparents were very good friends. And so when the 47 fires came, my family was living down in Kennebunk. And my grandmother came to pick up Barbara, and who was living with Mills at the time, to bring her down to Kennebunk where she would be, you know, quote, safer at that time. Um, so uh, Barbara was just uh, a couple of years younger than my, my aunt. So Barbara picked up her suitcase, brought it back down to Kenny Mom. She opened up the suitcase, and it wasn't hers. <laughs> I, I believe, if I can remember the story, it was her mother's uh, like fur coat. <laughs> but luckily, my, my aunt and she were about the same age, so they were able to uh, give her clothes so she could wear. 
So that was one of the one of the things. Um, my my dad also fought in the fires in, in Kennebunk, and he can remember being on the coal road, and like a lot of the people, they would say it sounded like a freight train. My uh, uncle at the time was uh, was on was on working on the phones. Um, I think maybe some of you may know the McDonald's. Well, Jeff McDonald, the plumber, they live on Parkway Road. Well, Mr. McDonald um, during the fire was living in Kennebunk, and his job was to replace batteries and flashlights. And across from the McDonald's home, there is an old stump that was being burned down on the voice of the fire that's still there. I think that's all I have to say, but there's little bits and pieces that, that come up every once in a while. And through these kind of uh, presentations is where we can pick up another little story or something. And if that, if you're willing, if you might be able to, at the end, take down your uh, your story and then we can add it to our question <coughs> that we have over here. Thank you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, uh. The movie you're going to be watching, it's in three parts, but we're only seeing the first one. It's newsreel footage that um, cameramen from the cameramen, camera women also um, came and filmed the fire as it was happening. And it's, it's that dramatic, you know, 40s, 50s music with it and uh, kind of um, it, it, it's, it kind of adds to it because you realize with the sound of the fire and everything, it was, it was amazing to watch something like that. So I think we're going to try to play the you know, movie. Part one, part six, yes, isn't the newsreel part one? Oh, yeah, I think it is. It's the beginning of the CD. Yep, it's the beginning. Yep, it is. I can go ahead. So and... give us a moment for our technology and yeah, it should be good. good. You need the light yeah. still? Yeah. No. Oh, my baby, you know, it's too loud, you know. <laughs> From October 14th to the 27th, 1947, more than 200 forest fires raged throughout the Maine, consuming nearly a quarter million acres of high forests, and in some cases, wiping out entire towns. York, Oxford, and Hancock counties were especially hard hit. Several others throughout Maine were threatened. In many cases, fierce winds gusting up to 80 miles an hour drove these fires so rapidly that hundreds of homeowners escaped the massive flame fronts and only the clothes they were wearing. Generations of heirlooms and other prized possessions were lost forever. In 1947, fire officials on both the local and state levels had little ability to communicate with each other in the situation, and no one was prepared for a disaster of this magnitude. And drought conditions existed as little or no rain fell during the three months in October. The weather for the entire forest fire season was unusual, going from one extreme to another. In early March, an abnormally warm period saw temperatures reaching even the high 80s, causing snow to melt quickly and disappear from fields and woods at about the same time. To those engaged in forest fire control, this was an ominous sign. However, the months of April through June were cold and wet. By mid-July, a complete reversal of weather and ground conditions took place and continued well into fall. During that period, 108 days passed without any appreciable rain. The dryness of the soil was reflected in the foliage, especially with hardwoods. Lack of moisture caused the leaves to dry and fall prematurely. Vegetation was bone dry. 
and Maine was ripe for burning. On October 23rd, all hell broke loose. Never slept. Lived on coffee supplies. Couldn't. Chance mother was over. She was 65 and she walked by after. Someone called and said, You've got to get out. And he jumped into a model eight for the my uh, cousin and headed for who wants to be and got caught right across the road. And we were made of what to do and turned around. It was in the back of us. And I remember my cousin. He said, this old baby will go anywhere. <laughs> So he backed it up and turned it around and we went back around the mountain. In Grand Hill alone, 200 homes and businesses were destroyed. Community was gone. Sadly enough, Brownfield was not the exception. Many small towns were gutted by these conflagrations. It was a very hot day. And knowing the fire was in progress, I was helping my mother make corn chowder to take to Iowa in that evening. And at noon, they came and picked it up, told us that no problems, we would be safe because it could never cross Shepherd's River. Well, then by mid afternoon, they came through and told us we had 20 minutes. So we were totally unprepared. The town of Newfield suffered too. In the Goose Rocks and Cape Corpus district of Kennebunk Court, more than 200 homes, most of them summer cottages, were destroyed as this fire burned its way to the Atlantic Ocean. In Hancock County, Bar Harbor, with its palatial summer homes and grand hotels, all sustained massive damage. Half of the landscape in this world famous summer retreat was blackened. <laughs> And there's a lot of peach down, so I thought it was just the end of October. And the um, stacks were landing all around, but we were doing a pretty good job putting them out underneath the porches and things like that. And I had to look up on top of the roof, this Marvin Hotel, which was huge, and the bottom of was right next door. There was a little patch of fire, probably right. I was so big, you know, right by the chimney. It's gone. Just like it. Just in Washington County, residents in the towns of Jonesboro, Machias, and surrounding communities had to be evacuated. More than 20,000 acres of timber and wildlands were burned. In a one hour period on October 23rd, the fire traveled within six miles. I was up in North Waterville when the uh... Went across the road and left the board yard. And that was a, a, a you've seen her board stack, you know, and that fire would hit them. It was almost like they would explode. That would take board, 12 inch board, 10, 12 feet long, right in the air, all the fire. You know, there was such a current from that. And I think it's scary when you see something like that. If a train was going, if you laid the track and the train went over, it wouldn't make any more noise. In one week, 15 fires each burned at least 5,000 acres. In many cases, families had only a few minutes to gather their belongings before leaving their homes for safer ground. And Mary said to us, what do you want? They were saved, and I said, well, I like my piano, but I know you can't save it. Oh, yes, she said, we can put it in the dump truck. So it was on casters, and they wheeled it out and put it in the truck. The last time I saw Brownfield when we got to the Ricker place, I looked back and Brownfield was all ablaze. 
The wind is blowing really, you know, almost like a hurricane. You know, because it was blowing almost by a long ahead of it, which was consequently sad more by it. Just an awful situation. On the evening of October 23rd, Governor Horace Lundgren declared a state of emergency. In a broadcast to the people of Maine, he requested all citizens give whatever help they could to the Forest Department. The President of the United States, at the request of the Governor and the Maine Congressional Delegation, also declared a state of emergency. The President's action immediately made available more access equipment and tools from the Office of Civil Defense for all the fire areas. The Forestry Department asked for help from both the Army and Navy and got it. Soldiers provided much needed equipment and additional manpower to help weary volunteer firefighters battle the fires. By month's end, nearly 36 main towns had sustained heavy losses. Nine were practically leveled, with property damage totaling nearly $70 million. Timber losses were estimated at $10 million. In today's terms, these losses would equal well over $3 billion. Hundreds of mayors lost their jobs, as many businesses also were destroyed. 16 people lost their lives. People just couldn't believe, you know, the devastation. But there was, it just, I think it humbled everybody. And that's why for years afterwards, and I think even today, there are enough of us alive that when we have a fire, uh, you know, you got to get to it. Um, when the last flames were contained, more than 2,500 people were left homeless. You can't believe the noise. And I said, I've been overseas, and I think I was scared during the fire when the time went out go red. You know, you just figured that you won't go get out. You just figured there was nothing that was going to put this fire out. You know, the number of times again, you know, the whole state was going to go. In fact, it wasn't much to stop it. You got to the ocean. Firefighters frequently had to drop their equipment and run from flame fronts, reaching as high as 300 feet. Intense and erratic fire was unlike anything firefighters had seen before. It was blowing. It was a, it was a funny. It was a funny feeling. Uh, the embers, uh, the smoke. You hear roar, just like a, a freight train roar, and then there'd be complete silence. Nothing. And it was here. And then it would start again. Relief finally came for thousands of weary firefighters on November 8th, when rains fell over much of the state. Several days afterwards, yes, longer after I'd gone back to work, I drove through the Eagle Lake Road out to the head of Stone Sound. And that was really just flat. And I can remember saying, I think the rocks burned too. Everything was so black and bare. Throughout the ordeal, neighbors pitched in, neighbor helping neighbor. 
Everybody helped everybody else. I never any place anywhere that before. I had more people working together than more than done. It was wonderful. The Red Cross and Civil Defense held flee and temporarily house the homeless. Hundreds of steel buildings were brought in by the military to serve as homes, schools, and churches, some of which are still in use today. Never in Maine's history had so many people been affected by such a disaster, and never had so many people come to the aid of their fellow citizens. He was speechless. There was nothing anywhere. And to get through the highway was something in itself. The trees were burned, the winds were down. It was just a, an unmistakable mystery. But everybody else was in the same boat. Everybody pitched together. You were no worse off than your neighbor, and everybody was just together. Take something like that to find out how much you appreciate your neighbors and your relatives. That was good. When the smoke settled, the damage was not unlike that of a massive bombing raid seen during World War II. Just something that uh, nobody ever believed could possibly ever happen to them. And uh, it's like, I'm sure it happened in, in the war in Northern Europe or something like that, and you don't know you're in a town and all of that. And uh, so, what did they, what did they feel like? And what did they feel like now? It's the same thing that we did. At the time, you didn't know whose houses it was. I mean, with so many going, you didn't know where you were. Oh, I remember so well feeling so empty, so sick to my stomach, and so scared. And my folks were just devastated. As I remember driving to the town, all you could see was cellar holes and chimneys. The chimneys were still standing and there was still smoking. There was um, steel roofing, which was basically what most every house had. Of course, that survived and that was all. Yeah, uh, devastating. Something that you don't, uh, you don't forget right on. It's kind of burning again. Yeah. Yeah. Investigations into the causes of these fires revealed several sources, ranging from careless backyard debris burning to unattended campfires. And all too often, many of these fires were believed to be arson. In 1949, as a result of these fires, forestry officials from the New England states and the provinces of Quebec and New Brunswick met and formed what is now called the Northeast Forest Fire Compact. Whenever fires or other natural disasters occur, these members provide mutual aid. This cooperative agreement was among the first of its kind in the nation. Shortly after the 1947 fire season, the Maine legislature established several forest fire prevention laws to less of a chance of a repeat disaster. Strict open burning requirements were established as well as tougher penalties for violators. Later, mechanized equipment operating in the forest came were required to have spark arresters installed on exhaust systems. Additional campsites were established where recreational fires could safely be built. An aggressive fire prevention program was established. In an effort to quickly spot forest fires, a network of aerial detection flights was begun. Today, Maine Forest Service Rangers and municipal firefighters are better prepared to deal with forest fires. Training has improved greatly over the past half century, and excellent cooperation exists among state, local, and federal fire organizations and landowners. 
Firefighting equipment also is both on the ground and in the air. Today, excellent communication systems were in place, far cry from the limited systems that existed in 1947. When fire strikes today, water bombing helicopters from the main forest service arrive quickly, and in many cases, can slow the spread of a forest fire until ground crews to establish control lines around the fire's perimeter. Newer forms of mechanized ground equipment grew to aid firefighters as well. In general, both Forest Service and local fire department personnel are much better prepared when a forest fire breaks out. Could Maine ever experience another disastrous autumn like that of 1947? Forest rangers and other fire officials say the likelihood of a repeat disaster is not great. However, Mainers must not let their guard down and must always be prepared to make a rapid strike against all uncontrolled fires. Our state's economy is greatly dependent on a healthy forest environment, and protecting our forests from fire should always remain a priority. There at the bottom. At the bottom. Yeah. Thank you, Kat. Um, that was a great movie. I, I and I remember I first saw it. <clears throat> the things that happened after the fire were very significant. Um, the, we have two firefighters here, and the the modern fire department in Maine, probably nationally, has changed tremendously <laughs> since that fire. Communication, um, regulations. One thing that struck me was they didn't even have in the fire department's um, equipment that was compatible. So somebody would bring something to help and it, it wouldn't go in right. And all those things were, were a direct result of this disaster. So anything else that you have been in your training? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Charm was gone. What you said to that? They had some of the French radios on batteries. That's all they had for radio back then. You have one down on the plate on the station. Yeah. Um, first fire truck was bought. The fire department incorporated in 1949. Before then, it was kind of a loose organization with the foundation money for it. They incorporated, became established, mm -hmm. purchased in 1953. Chevy the truck. I don't see just the first fire truck. Everything else was what you saw in there ambulances, old yeah. um, tankers, old food could... trucks, whatever they had. So the progression is going to happen again, probably not in that stature. The worst stories I heard that I can see it happening as fire would crest the hill, go over to another town, and go, well, it's not our problem anymore. And they kept the home, fight it for weeks, or a days. And, and that happened. Yeah. Like you said, the NASA shared the spread and stuff and that kind of thing. It was a different time. And I didn't realize mutual aid was something that was always in existence, that concept. Well, when I joined in 1938, I found the next state in the old name, the state of Buxton, had three different departments, the principal and other person first. Saying okay, this is the same power. Wow. And that's how it was. That's yeah. the old way of doing it. Come on. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, there's a, an interview, an audio interview, that, um, 
of a man, Albert and Doris. Doris Rich. Doris right. Rich. Yes. That was recorded in 1989. Does that sound familiar? Do you know the name? Mm -hmm. Riches? You know the Riches. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, I'm gonna hopefully it'll work. My my audio didn't work and I have it set up up back. So I'm gonna if you guys just want to talk amongst HDMI, yourselves for a right. second and I will plug like this in and <clears throat> keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> And if not, we're going to try, I think we're going to be able to put this up on the town website. Okay. We're going to check into that. It's, it's amazing to listen to this man. It's yeah, like it listening is. to my dad. So, while that's going, uh, as a society, we're planning on doing next year is for the budget. And those lectures are too much. Sorry, Bill, you want to use the mic? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mike? <laughs> so we're, we're planning on doing some lectures next year. Uh, we don't have uh, time and the dates and what we're actually going to be talking about, but probably one of them will be is how did the town of Lima get its name? That's a story. And <laughs> then Very cool. another one may be that we're going to have a uh, bicentennial celebration, which of course never happened. So we have a uh, Bunch of information on that. And there might be another one on, you know, um, they say that Lyman was incorporated in 1780. Well, it was actually incorporated in 1778. And there was some controversy on, on, on 1778. So that's one of the things that we will hopefully be uh, covering. So if you want to find out what's going on, you can either go to our Facebook page or our uh, web page, and we'll post it on both of those um, when we have a schedule and what we're going to be talking about. And it will probably, well, I can't say where it's going to be held yet. So it'll be held in town someplace. <laughs> If you'd like, I'm going to put this on. It will be loud enough to hear. So if you'd like to continue looking at some of the displays and getting a snack, and I will call you all back if you want to listen to it from here. I just need a couple of minutes. Are you home? She said. So this is going to be running. It's very, it's not very loud, but it's loud enough to hear with um, quiet conversation. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to start it. I think we're gonna turn it on. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you were working around with Carpenter or me, and I worked with a cat. 
But I have to find the true in with the spoke. Yeah. Was the hottest. It was
Now, this, is, this stretch right out here is Dane Mills Road, is that right? Yeah. And then over beyond the coast is the Jay Road. Yeah. Now, it's supposed to be the Robert Road. Now, it's the Robert Road. Robert Road. Well, Robert Road. Robert Road. Robert Road. Robert Road. Robert Road. Everybody moves in here different, you know. They <laughs> built this big dam over there to put in the bill, you know. Yeah. They want to have a, uh, a woman deal with that. And that was uh, the Robert Road. And, yeah. That month, I was with that. And he was going to have his head boy said, We're going to walk the road because it's wet. Now it ain't anymore. It's the mass road. Yeah. But you think they'll call this a broad road sometime? Do ah. you think they'll call this a broad road sometime out here? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. No, it's these people that change the name, you know. Well, I'm getting confused between Day Road and Day Mill Road. I don't know what you think about that. I would got out. Day Road, as I say, some of them people that call it the Rogers Road. Yeah. And the most of the old folks that live in there for all of these years, they call it the Day Road. The Day Road is the last of what's lost in the train. Well, on my record, you know, there was a mistake about 130,000 acres. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Let me tell you something. What kind of help did you get after the car? We said Salvation Army came in. Navy left the town of Delaware. Salvation Army, they gave him clothes. They gave him shelter. They said, you know, it was better than sneaking out of the woods. What did you do for a living? I mean, what's the burning? What's the most part of it? What did you do for a living? Well, after the fire, uh, Jewish in one room and lost their shop, buck shop, and everything. They bought Spanish Mill. And they started out and we started to saw all the logs that had birds, you know, that didn't fit the point in the foot. At the first, long they got them cut before the wood was cut in for the number. But along the last end of it, a lot of the wood was cut into it. They said it wasn't burning it. So I did that. And they had a lot of sawmills for when you get the number, and the only thing you could do was to cut logs and help the people plow them out and haul them to the mills and the mills were running and sometimes a shift and a half a day, you know. They worked over there for years. Where Spang is today. And when everything to move the wood was cleaned off, there was nothing else to be in. So I went cutting the wood for old man uh, Fox in uh, Union, and they used to use Celsius to pack dishes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And all the small parts, you know, all the knots, we call it up there. They used it for Celsius. <laughs> and after that run out, by, uh, by that time, they had a few more things started. They sold, Gillis had sold the bill to Spang Barn, he moved up there, and he'd been running there for about. 35, 36, 70 years, something yeah, like that. Do you ever see the season as dry as that? Ever see yeah, I have a season. Oh. Since then again, I have a real dry as dry as that. Yeah. And what do you call it? Do you think something like that could happen again, Albert? Why? Why in the hell are they in the house? Oh, right over here, next to the lady who lives there. Yeah. And we just finished it that one day. We finished that out. But we were going to start painting, painting it the next day to trim or do everything on it. But that was that same day to fire. Same day you finished, then you burn. Same day. That must have been about, uh, it's it's probably, probably around Thursday, 23rd. It's Sunday. 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 It's and now they've got things rigged up so we permit some things. You gotta have a thousand foot of footage to go out. Well, that's, that's all of the other stuff they got. Now, that don't make sense. You got 17 acres of that field over there. And you got a thousand foot of footage. Why don't we want to talk about politicians? I know. <laughs> now, we get out of the house and we're here and just want to pass six. Yeah, 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 yeah,
We're not going to chew you out because I want to make sure everybody sees everything they want to. Um, I wanted to also ask a question that's been driving us nuts. And where is Alan? Alan has his feelings about where this gas station was in the fire of 47. Now, where, where was the Amico, the Texaco one? That was it. 111 and 35. That's 111 and 35? Jackson's, Jackson's, Jackson's Corner. Corner. That is. Okay. Phew. Okay. I was always told it was the other one where Harry's is now. I was always told it was across the street. So it's at the, the corner. The schoolhouse was where that's. That's what I was told. But it's at that intersection. Right. Okay. Right. This one, where the Amacro station was, um, Krista from Homestead Market got a lot of pictures for me. And she has this one, and I think this Amico station was where Harvard, um, excuse me, Homestead Market it is. is now. Okay, it, is. it used to be called English Market. 
Piglets, yes. She was telling me about that, all the different names. Yeah, no that. bushes, Ivy. And then I remember yes. when George Hanson, it's like, well, she was real short, right? Yeah. yeah. The general always told me that the car was built real short. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great yeah, story. Yeah. Um, just, but I'm not old, Jim. I'm not old. <laughs> You're seasoned. The relatives are old. <laughs> um, I was just curious, did anything come up in what you were it, regarding what you were looking at or read or anything surprised you? I just, there are some things that we found that just kind of like the Indian tank that um, John Cook um, loaned us, that they had to carry that and it was about 60 pounds. Did still you have a on still for still like um, brush fires? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I Are they still making you? No, they're it's the old ones. It's more like a backpack now. Okay. Bag, yeah. like I mean, we're just fighting. But some, that's all they had, and they were fighting a raging fire. The other thing I learned about um, was that a lot of farm ponds were built, made, created after the fire. Does that, is that accurate? I, I used to see ponds, farms with ponds, but I thought, oh, you know, they all have a pond, but I never thought why. It's because of the water. The water source. I guess they have dry hydrants, which I learned about. Does anyone know what those are? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> it's just non-pressurized hydrants. Instead of having to put the hoses out, hard section hoses, you can just hook up to the pipe. And it just draft it. But. Okay, that's something I learned. Kind of thing. Anybody here who's done some? Oh, go ahead. I had a question about yeah. the wood. It says um, here. I didn't realize when I was looking at the wood over there. It says um, underground wood. Yes, that's another thing. Yeah. Yes. Then the roof. Yeah, it was, it, I could not understand the concept of an underground fire. It makes sense with the overhead and the walls of fire coming, but there were fires that found their way underground. And we have some wood there that um, mm. my husband Steve is holding it up. Our neighbor found this, he was excavating, he found this burnt wood. The tree is fine, and, but it's burnt wood underneath. And apparently on um, Wadley Pond, I heard, um, Arthur talk about it. If it traveled underground and then one side of Broadley was burnt on the what's now Broadley Pond Road. Does anyone know about that? That and then we heard it didn't, the other side was not burned. So things like that happen everywhere. Some water bill, one side of the road burned, the other side didn't. And it was it was all about, well, it was about the woods, but all about the wind. Because it came so furiously, they just couldn't stop it if it was on its way. Well, it's the gentleman that was interviewed want to know where, he, where that house was. Yeah. Uh, Jackson's Corner, going to help with the LI Road, about 35. Yep. And you, right after you go past the shop curve, this house is right on the left. The and diagonally across, it's uh, Bronze, who did the interview. Yes. Okay. Did they have the So if you look around, those are the only old houses on that whole section. Everything else is. After 47 bucks. Are you talking about where the mill is? No, no. 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 35. Going towards towards the other turn. Okay. No, 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 that's too far. You can't do it game ball from Texas. It's only about half a mile. Okay. First shot curve, right on the left. Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? You look around, and those are the only old houses. I've only been at this since Wow. Day Road, all those houses are <laughs> made because Clarence A. Uh, Taylor and wherever the guy was, they said a backfire. Yeah, um, Boothley. Yeah. Boothley, Brown, and all that. Yeah, that's, that was Clarence A. <laughs> and then the guy at the top, I can't remember his name. Bluefield was his there was Murphy. Up at the to... summit. Spain. Spain. No. Whoever Spain. Roberts. Roberts. That White House at the corner. Right. Those three set of backfires. And that's the only reason that yeah. area didn't. Between that whole diamond shaped area, between Bay Road, 111, 35, and the other end of the Bay Road, those are the only houses that survived. <laughs> and on Huff Road, the Huff House didn't burn because the wind changed. Or there was a a wet area behind that didn't allow the fire to come through. 
was like on the other side of that on Davis Road. That all turned down to 35 and 111 and wind change, and it didn't go up the hill. Uh, a little Lord, hill from 35 and 111. Lord's Lane, that all got burned except for Lord's Mill, that's at the end of our road. Right. Used to connect to the Davis Road. Yeah, uh, that mill survived. I don't know the history. Why did I don't know if it's afraid of water or whatever? I think it was because it had seals around. Huh? Davis. Davis on that. They must have sprayed water or something because that's the only place to survive. Everything else is burned. Yeah. Davis Road used to go through and uh, Davis place burned. Right here, Beach Orchard Road. Not during school hours, please. You can take a walk up. It used to be the Beach Orchard Road, and you'll see the foundation. Yep. I guess this was quite the uh, farmland up there. All beaches and farmland and everything else. It's still got all abandoned up there. Yeah, that's a tragedy, too. One is a tragedy. I would have afford it. <laughs> Yeah. A lot. The other thing I wanted to mention that was sad to me was a lot of property. It was hard to figure out the property lines after the fire. A lot of people got taken advantage of or took advantage of where the line was in terms of what where their their property was. And then the other thing was what what do they call short sale? Quick, quick claim deeds of that happened all the time. So people gobbled up land. Um, a, a man named Chapel did it on our pond. Chapel took a lot of land. He did take a lot of land. Lot of land. Yep. <clears throat> and it's, it's amazing how well, it's not amazing, it's, it's expected in some ways that, that developers are going to you know, rush in. But we talked to a lot of surveyors in those days, they said, Lyman was a nightmare to figure out where your property line was. Everybody hit, like, we have our property on 111. And I asked the guy, I know surveyors, how do you find the line? And it should be usually the defense wire. You pick a screwdriver four inches on the ground, see if you get the wire. I went four inches in the ground, there's a wire. The wire was four inches on the ground. That was the property line. Because of the fire? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, That's the, something I never heard. The defense post. Yeah. The wire dropped to the ground yeah. and then the leaf covered yeah. it up. It's just four inches and he was right. Too bad and I found the fact. You can still yeah. find the wire in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, and these surveyors in the beginning, it's not so bad now with all the houses. Yeah. Lima was a nightmare. And Chapel, he, he came in here and he took over the whole area. I know. So what you do when you have money? Yeah. <laughs> I just exactly. have another question. You remember him when he lived on South Street? <laughs> Chapel? No. Yeah, we, we had the, we had the farm on the side. Black River, and you lived just before it. You lived there right on that sharp curb where the water company just built their new house. It used to be a mound there. His house was right there. He lived there with his house. There's a lot of that in Maine, especially before 911. It's the place where the tree is by the rock. That kind of thing is not as common now, but after the fire, that all had to be figured out. Not well, because of 911, but because of property. Well, I was stoned too. I had a stump on my property. And that was that wire went right by the stump. Now the stump, I had to put a pipe in there for the stump run out through the years. I put wow. a pipe to show the wow. one of my motor wires. Just a question. Was there anything, just because I'm curious, that you found out or learned or you were wondering before and you kind of know now about the fire of 47? Anything that Kind of pops in, or something you heard from the, that you read from the stories. The world history was amazing. I had no idea. I knew his son lived there. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew. Of. I mm -hmm. didn't know where he lived in the street. Yeah. The stories that he had make a lot of sense now from what he was left. It's funny because my grandparents used a word that I haven't heard since them, and it was cousin. Cussed, the cussed, yes, that's a good word. Well, it used to be a law back. The state of Maine had a, a law that a lot of people lost their properties in the fires. And back in the 50s, if they go back, knowing where their property their line, they could just pay back the back taxes and maintain yeah. their land. A lot of them, that's stubborn as they were, they just 
fuck the loan. That's real name. And they just lost all that property. Yeah. All you have to do is pay back the back tax. Yeah, but in the 50s, people didn't have money. I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, right, right. taxes were very little. Right, right. But right. they just didn't want to bother. So, all right, I cannot thank you enough for coming on this beautiful day. It was a thank wonderful you. Great job. Very thank you. Job. Let me see. That should. I'll just have to hold it. Okay, go ahead. Well, we lived in the old uh, house. Uh, I want to speak up louder. Uh, we built a house there, and some of these artifacts that um, were all around the old foundation. And uh, so this is um, melted glass. There's several pieces of that in there. Um, that the uh, <clears throat> it was just around the edge of the foundation, old nails. Um, one of the interesting things, I don't know, there's the uh, there's a key here somewhere. Um, it was on top of a rock that was uh, I don't see it now, but it was uh, uh, it was a doorstep, and the key was underneath a bed of pine needles, which my daughter uncovered, and we decided, well, that must have been mat there and it uh, just 
burned in the fire, and that was all that was left of it, is that uh, skeleton key. And this piece of wood came from a tree directly behind the Jaguar Cemetery. And <clears throat> that tree kept diminishing somewhat over the years, and I decided to save a piece of it before it was completely gone. There were several in the area, one on the causeway, one on the Clark's Woods Road that I knew of, and a couple more. Uh, but this house all uh, burned in the fire, and the barn was across the street, the foundation still there, and that all went up in, as well. And so when we got it, it was just a cellar hole, an old well, which is still there in the front. And, um, so, cool. so I just uh, saved all these things as I found them around the uh, foundation because it was just part of history that I wanted to preserve. And now I'm just happy to share it with the uh, Historical Society. Thanks to Steve. And uh, just uh, so everybody else can enjoy it. As well. Thank you. That's really amazing. Wow. Yeah. What a find.